Hello and welcome back to Dr. Logic Awkwardly Does Logic in Her Office. Today we are going to talk about constructing interpretations to make sets of categorical propositions true. So last time we looked at, given an interpretation, what sorts of sentences are true on that interpretation. What we're doing is the other way around. Given a set of sentences, can we construct an interpretation that makes them all true? So let me bring up my handy dandy whiteboard because I've got a couple of examples set up there already. First, let's look at the blue sentences. So we have a term language whose categorimatic terms are B, C, D, and E. And how can we construct an interpretation that make these sentences true? Well, what you need to do is basically set up, we need to have an interpretation of B, which is gonna be some set, an interpretation of C, which is also gonna be a set, an interpretation of D, guess what, another set, and an interpretation of E. So we are constructing four different sets. Now I've drawn the curly bracket on one side, but not on the other side, because right now I don't know how many things I'm going to put in there. Now, the first one says that if we want to make it true, then it has to be that the interpretation of C is a subset of the interpretation of B, or that every object that we put here in C, we also have to put here in B. Now, we also know that every interpretation has to have at least one object in it. So we'll start with that. And I'm going to just use lowercase consonants to pick out our objects. Or, you know, you can draw shapes, you can do stars, you can do different colored things. You can pick names of your friends, you can do whatever you want. But for now, let's just say that we have, we know we have an object in both of these. So whatever is in C also has to be in the interpretation of B. So right now we have that lowercase d is in both of them. Now, if we look at number two, we have that everything that is in D is also in B. Now, again, we know that there is at least one thing in each interpretation. So there is some object F. Now, we don't wanna put D in there because we don't necessarily know if the things in C are the same as the things in D. So don't make any assumptions like that. Always introduce a new object if you're not certain, if your propositions don't force you to use the same one. But once we know that F is in the interpretation of D, proposition number two tells us we'd better put it up here as well. Otherwise, BAD is not going to be true. Then we have number three, something that is both in C and in E. Now, right now, E doesn't have anything in it. So again, we should stick something in it just to make sure it's not empty. Now, because this is a new thing, we can say, well, why not let that be the thing that is in E and also in C? So let's go back up here, add that. Ah, but remember proposition one. That one said everything that you put in C, you better also put in B. So let's go up and add G there as well. And then we have the last one, which says that there's something that is in D that is not in E. And if you look, we've got F in the interpretation of D already and G in the interpretation of E. So in fact, four is already true. We don't have to change anything in order to make it true. So if we just close our curly brackets, this is an interpretation of the categorimatic terms that makes all four of these sentences true. So the interpretation of B has D, F, and G. The interpretation of C has D and G. The interpretation of I has F, and the interpretation of E has G. Beautiful! All right, we had so much fun doing that. Let's do it again. Except we're gonna look at the second set of sentences. So the first one says, well, let's set our, set our things up. We have here three categorimatic terms, D, capital E, and F. Now the first one says that there's something that's in D that's not in F. Well, we know that there has to be at least one thing in D, let's call it lowercase b, because all of our interpretations are always non-empty. Now, we can satisfy the first claim by putting B in the interpretation of D and just not putting it in F. Looking then at the second one, this one says that there is something in F, let's call it 
C, and that thing is also in D. So to add that in there. Now, you'll notice that both propositions one and two use the same terms, but they have different copulae. Well, one just says that some D is not F, and one says some F is not D. Uh, some F is D, sorry. If you think about it, this is entirely fine. It's just like saying that some animal is not a cat, and some cat is an animal. Perfectly consistent. Let's look at the third proposition now. So this is EAF. This says that everything that is in the interpretation of F, which right now is just C, also has to go into the interpretation of E. So there we are. Now, look at the last one. This one says that no D is E. So nothing that's in the interpretation of D can be in the interpretation of E. Uh-oh. We are in trouble because we had this C here. Now we have this C here. And that is a contradiction with the claim that there is nothing that is in both of them. So at this point, what do we do? You might say, okay, well, maybe we need to take C out of D. So maybe let's just scribble this out for now. Let's try again, uh, just to say where we're going. Let's use a different color. Um, but why did we have C in the interpretation of D in the first place? Well, that came from uh, the second proposition. I said that there's something that is in both F and D. And right now we don't have that. So let's, let's go ahead and maybe we can add a new thing. So let's put D there. This is looking positive. We've now made uh, this one is true because nothing is in both D and E. We've made that one true again. That one doesn't really seem to be a problem. But now look at this claim again that uh, every F is E. We've got something that's an F. We need to put it in D. And then, oh no, look at that. We have exactly the same problem again. We've got D in both capital D and capital E. So this is, to use the technical term, not a consistent set. There is, uh, the, you cannot construct an interpretation that makes all of these propositions true together. Now, an interesting question to ask, and I will leave this again as an exercise for the viewer. If you want to give it a try, constructing an argument and leaving it in the comments. I will happily take a look at any of your attempts. But the question is, how can you show that no interpretation will make one through four red all true at the same time. Because what I've shown is that this interpretation doesn't. But you can kind of see that if you kept turning on, you'd keep running into the same problem. So it would be nice to be able to make explicit this fact. This is not a fact within the language, it's a fact about the language. So this is a meta language result that we could prove about this particular set of sentences and any interpretations whatsoever. So give it a go. How would you show, how would you argue, how would you prove, how would you convince someone else that it is impossible to come up with an interpretation that makes all four of those true? Give it a go, stick it in the comments. I look forward to seeing what you try. Until then, take care and see you next time.